good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Uh, happy birthday, Rock. 90. Is that serious? I would. I thought you were in your 80s. Yeah, 90. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yesterday. My bag is also 90. <laughs> I sent uh, Roger a clip of an interview that they did about the bag. Uh, if you get a chance to, to see uh, the story behind it and why I keep it, you know. Although I, I think, you know, every day that I come in here with this bag, it's kind of an indictment against all of you, right? Because it's kind of like, you know, walking by the Samaritan who's all, you know, or the Samaritan walking by the guy who's all beat up, right? And the priest walks by, you know, the Levite walks by. You guys see me day in and day out with the bag and nobody says, you know, can we help you with the bag? <laughs> Don't do that, by the way. I love my bag. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're going to pick up where we left off on uh, Jeremiah, and uh, last time we went through all of the symbolic actions, and again the point of that is to demonstrate that at least the way the prophets are portrayed, uh, it's not simply a matter of here's the word and here's the fulfillment, right? Uh, these are, the best thing I can call them is like drama folks, they're activists, they're poets, they sing, uh, uh, they, they, they are on display, their body is part of the prophetic message, and this demonstrates it. By the way, this is not too far from what Jesus does. The miraculous deeds that he does are usually an illustration of a larger point, right? So here, it's basically the loincloth, the wine jars, the jug, the yoke, you know, very physical. But Jesus will do something in order to demonstrate a message. He can do it, right? Like when he says to uh, the paralytic, you know, your sins are forgiven. And if you're like, you know, they're all upset at him, right, people about, you know, only God can forgive sins. And he says, well, so that you, you know that I can do it, right? He says to the paralytic, get up, right? And so Jesus stands in that tradition of doing things to illustrate who he is, where his power comes from, a lesson. Uh, John takes that to the farthest extreme by actually only referring to the miracles as signs, right? And if you say it's a miracle, you can kind of get self-absorbed. Wow, that was a miracle, thank God. I'm much better, things are looking up. In John's gospel, all of that is true, but the point is it's a sign for something else, right? So Jesus saying, I'm the resurrection and the life, what's the point of that? Yeah, I know it. No, 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 I'm gonna show you. And he raises someone from the dead, right? So Jesus stands in that tradition, and not unlike uh, Jeremiah, Jesus also suffers, right? Just like Jeremiah suffered. And we saw a few examples here where he had opposition. Opposition from prophets, opposition from priests, opposition from his own people to the acts he was doing, right? And so these come out in the symbolic acts. We're actually going to look at a few verses now where we see kind of the threat he was under. Let me find the next page here. Jeremiah persecuted. Okay, oh, that went all the way to the beginning. Don't want to do that. Okay, Jeremiah persecuted. So a few points about this. And remember, we talked about Jeremiah's message being pro-Babylonian, right? I mean, that's how it sounded, pro-Babylonian. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it, and it wasn't just a matter of being pro-Babylonian. Uh, you know, Judah had theological reasons not to want to, you know, be in, in Babylon's uh, graces, as it were. But the people back home, they were kind of pro-Egyptian, right? And that's something we're going to see. The, the two big powers here were Babylon and Egypt. And, and Judah went back and forth between them. And it was because of this back and forth between them that the Babylonians got fed up and decided to come in and destroy the place. Right? We'll look at that as well. But his own people. First one, Jeremiah's life, life is threatened by his own kind. Right? This is reminiscent of Jesus Right? when John says, He came to his own, and his own received him not. Right? And that's usually taken one of two ways theologically. Like he came to his people, the Jews, and they did not receive him, right? Or, given John's high Christology, he came to humans, and humans did not receive him, right? So you've got kind of that, that double way of looking at it. But here you have uh, Jeremiah, and actually he's praying for retribution. He's praying for retribution. This is the other thing that, about Jeremiah. You get to see his humanity. He doesn't hide his frustrations. He asks God to punish those who are punishing him, and he uses some of the most uh, God-awful language to do it, 
right? Like, like the stuff he says is not the kind of thing that you can read in polite company, right? I mean, what he wants to happen to his enemies, what he calls them, what he says about uh, what they're doing to him. I mean, you think about the language he uses. Think about the worst language you can use, right? He actually uses the language of sexual assault, right? His enemies are out there trying to seduce him as if to sexually assault him. And as if that weren't enough, he actually says that about God, right? He says that about God, that you calling me was like seducing me, right? I mean, he, he saw himself as having gotten a raw deal, right? I mean, think about how we think about ministry, right? He's gonna be called, he's gonna preach, he's gonna have a flock, you know, hopefully all nice kinds of things. I don't know if all the prophets kind of saw it that way, but he certainly didn't expect the ministry he got, and he blames God for, for it, and he basically calls God a seducer. You raped me. That's basically the language. I mean, it, again, you, you, it's like inconceivable. It's like worse than blasphemy to think that way. So it's good to look at Jeremiah as a reminder of uh, what ministry can be, right? How you might feel, how that even in circumstances that appear to be negative, dark, hopeless, somehow God is behind that as well. Somehow God is still working through that. I mean, that is basically the idea, right? All of this was God's doing. The fortunate thing is that there's a human person who feels the cost of it. And that's something you see the prophets kind of bear. In that sense, people like Paul, you know, they bore the brunt of their ministry, right? In terms of being chased around, being whipped, being stoned, left for dead, right? The paradigms for ministry look very different than the way we conceive of ministry today. Right? And it's good to go back and reflect on these works and look at these lives and the cost, cost of discipleship, cost of following God, and ask yourselves, wow, uh, what's different? Are we different? Should we be different? Is being different a good sign? Right? I mean, you think about the churches in the book of Revelation. Right? Those that were uh, happy-go-lucky, they had problems. Those that were suffering and enduring were the ones that were being commended. Right? So there's that, that thread there. So I like to kind of look through Jeremiah uh, just to kind of get the humanity of, of his ministry, of, of his commitment, obviously, to speak the word of God despite the fact that it cost him. Right. And remind ourselves that sometimes, sometimes following God is a matter of suffering. Now, I'm not talking about self-induced suffering, like you're a pain in the butt to people. You deserve to be suffering if that's the case, right? <laughs> but if it's true, genuine virtue and good living. Okay, uh, there's a plot against Jeremiah. I should read some of these verses for, for coloring. Uh, I also brought, again, our Old Testament parallels. We're going to have Nebuchadnezzar's own uh, witness about what he did uh, to Judah and why. So this is the guy who conquered uh, Jerusalem. We'll read a little historical record there. Give me a second here. What happened to the microphone stand? Let me steal that one. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes.
May a cry be heard from their houses when you bring the marauders suddenly upon them. For they have dug a pit to catch me and laid snares for my feet. Yet you, O Lord, know all their plotting to kill me. Do not forgive their iniquity. Do not blot out their sin from your sight. Let them be stripped up before you. Deal with them while you are angry. And that's a very telling line, right? You know how they say you should never respond to an email when you're angry? <laughs> or, you know, take it out on your kids when you're in the heat of the moment, right? Jeremiah wants to ensure, right? Because God is a merciful God. He might cool off. He said, no, no, no. Deal with them while you're angry, right? The fill of it. Give it to them all. So he's obviously coming from a place of great pain, great betrayal. These are his own townspeople. He's only doing what's right. He's only doing what God told him to do. Right? I mean, that's when it's like, come on now. I can't catch a break. I'm doing what you said. I'm doing it how you said it. I'm doing it to the people who know me. I'm doing it for my people. And all I get is punishment for it. Right? Deal with them while you're angry. Right? It's got a spirit of, of Jonah there. Right? He's, he's upset that God had mercy on the Assyrians. If you remember that story. Jeremiah is persecuted by the priest Peshur, and he gets renamed Terror all around. So again, the thing to remember about, about these guys, the people who are opposing him, they're the holy ones. They're the leadership. They're fellow prophets. They're fellow priests, right? It's not like the enemy. Like, you know, you see an enemy coming. Oh, that's an enemy. But when it's your own kind, that's a special kind of betrayal. And again, think about that paradigm. I mean, even the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was betrayed by one of his own, right? That's a kind of a drumbeat that you have. Uh, so this is worth uh, reading, uh, just a few verses. And again, it's kind of humorous when you when you kind of see the back and forth of how they're dealing with each other. But again, remember, like we talked about last week, it's not like the truth was clear. You got two respected competing prophets, and one of them actually works for the king who's in the line of David. Who are you going to believe, right? That's not Jeremiah. Okay. Now the priest Peshur, son of Immer, who was the chief officer in the house of the Lord, right, so this is an official, right, this is an official, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Peshur struck the prophet Jeremiah and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. So he hits him, right, and puts him in stocks. The next morning, I mean, he left him there all night. I mean, that's pretty uncomfortable, right? Never mind, you, you've been smitten. <laughs> the next morning when Peshur returned, Jeremiah returned, released Jeremiah from the stocks. Jeremiah said to him, The Lord has named you not Peshur, but terror all around. Like he renames him. You get renamed by Jeremiah when he's mad. That's not good news for you. Right? <laughs> and if it's terror all around, right, that doesn't seem like a positive message. For thus says the Lord, so he's going to explain it, but thus says the Lord, I am making you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies while you look on. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. He shall carry them captive to Babylon and shall go them with the sword. I will give all the wealth of this city, all its gain, all its prized belongings, and all its treasures of the kings of Judah into the hand of their enemies who shall plunder them and seize them and carry them to Babylon. And you, Peshur, and all who live in your house and shall, shall go into captivity, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall die, and there you shall be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied falsely. Right? So he hears him in the house of the Lord, cannot tolerate it, assaults him, puts him in stocks, comes back the next day to release him to see if you know, Jeremiah has learned the lesson. He has not learned a lesson, right? <laughs> and he basically tells him, you're going to see all your friends die, and you are going to die and be buried in a foreign land, which is particularly, uh, 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 you know, offensive and painful for a priest, a priest who resides in the Holy Land, the land of God, works in the temple, to be told you're going to be killed by the infidels, and you're going to be buried in their land, not even in your land, right? That That is a... Especially problematic for a priest. Right? So Jeremiah is not playing games. Um, and again, it's fascinating, you know, despite the fact that he is suffering for what he has to do, he speaks the word of the Lord. 
right? And, and people, of course, we've seen already Hananiah perish because of this, and now for sure. Jeremiah prophesies in the temple, right? And again, this is, you know, again, offensive. It's one thing if you're prophesying in a village, right? Nobody cares. When you go to the central location of theological orthodoxy, right? And do it there and say, this place is going to be destroyed, right? I mean, how would you tolerate someone walking in during one of your services here at Calvary <clears throat> while, you know, pastor's preaching and he's get up there and grab the mic from him? He says, God's going to destroy this place. He's been wanting to do it for years. <laughs> I mean, what kind of uproar would there be? The guy's insane. He's nuts. What are you talking about, right? It makes no sense. So he prophesies in the temple. Now, here's what's interesting. He compares what's going to happen to the temple to what happened to Shiloh. Okay. Now, Shiloh, if you don't know, is a holy place that was a holy place before the temple was constructed, right? If, if, you, if you go back to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel in, in the Hebrew Bible are one book. 1 Kings and 2 Kings, one book. That entire narrative from 1 Samuel to 2 Kings is one story. Right? And here's what's fascinating. Opening that story, right, Saul and Samuel and David, is Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was, being destroyed. Right? Think about it. that's that's foreshadowing. Think about a movie, we see a movie and something happens at the beginning and then it says it goes back, right? It foreshadows. In other words, the narrative from 1 Samuel to 2 Kings starts with the destruction of a holy place and ends with the destruction of the temple, right? So Jeremiah, when he says, you know what God's going to do? He's going to do to you guys, to this temple, what he did in Shiloh. In other words, God has already done it before, and he'll do it again, right? So that's particularly offensive. So he's basically saying, uh, uh, you know, God's going to destroy you just like Shiloh was destroyed. He's threatened with death, of course, rightly so, right? And as I mentioned last week, somebody quotes Micah 3.12. They don't say, hey, Micah 3.12. But they say, hey, the prophet Micah said something similar. As a matter of fact, you find Micah being quoted in Jeremiah. So if you ever want to figure out know, scripture, quoted scripture, here's an example. Of just, just a couple verses. Take a look at Jeremiah 7.12 to 15. Go now. Actually, I, actually I'll, I'll, I'll begin a little earlier. Just again, the drama here is, is so good. Right? They should make a movie out of this stuff. Right? I'm, I'm tired of the Exodus movie. Like, I want to see the Jeremiah Pursuit movie. <laughs> here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are safe. In other words, they were deluded. Only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by name, become a den of robbers? Who said that? Jesus. Jesus. So this is the context for Jesus' words. So that has a particular, I mean, for him to say that, he's quoting the words of someone who was prophesying the destruction of the temple. And Jesus' context was one of the same thing. Right? Again, that's an amazing, amazing parallel. <laughs> so you made it a place of robbers. Uh, da, da, da. You know, you know, I too am watching, says the Lord. <laughs> Go now to my place that was in Shiloh. So in other words, he's taking you to the place where there was originally, you know, a shrine, a holy place. Go over there. Go see, right? Where I made my name dwell at first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Right? Again, even that is kind of a sign, right? He was doing all these signs, right? He says, okay, go to that place. What's, what's there now? Right? What's there? And now, because you have done all these things, says the Lord, and when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen. And when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place that I gave to you and to your ancestors, just what I did to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, 
just as I cast out all your kinfolk, all the offspring of Ephraim, which is another word uh, for Israel. So basically, they're going to suffer the same fate. So they want to kill Jeremiah. Micah 5.12 gets quoted. And there's another prophet, Uriah, which, you got a book of Uriah in your Bibles? Have you ever heard of Uriah? He was a prophet. He was around uh, exactly during Jeremiah's time. And he preached the same message. But we don't have any record of any of his prophecies or books. Only the record of Jeremiah, which basically says <laughs> that uh, the king targeted him to kill him. He escapes to Egypt, right? Again, there goes Egypt again. And the king sends his soldiers to grab him, bring him back, and kills him. Right? So Jeremiah was spared simply because somebody said, you know, you sound like Micah, right? Uriah, maybe he didn't have the status, maybe he didn't have enough friends, uh, but they killed him. So again, a costly, a costly message. to find the Micah verse. Oh, there it is. Okay, so chapter, if you want to jot it down, chapter 26, verses 6 and 9 is where you have Micah 3.12 uh, quoted. So this is, just so you can hear what it says, Micah 26. <laughs> Jeremiah, Jeremiah 26, and it's 6 to 9, and that actually, uh, I think that's 16. 16 to 19, 16 to 19. Then the officials, beginning with verse 16, then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, this man does not deserve the sentence of death, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord. Right. So note, who's defending uh, Jeremiah? People. Right. No, he doesn't deserve to die. And they're telling the priest that. And some of the elders of the land arose and said to all the assembled people, Micah of Moresheth, who prophesied during the days of King Hezekiah of Judah, said to all the people of Judah, Thus says the Lord of hosts. So this is an earlier prophet during an earlier reign. Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house of the wooded height, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Did King Hezekiah of Judah and all of Judah actually put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord? And did not the Lord change his mind about the disaster that he had pronounced against them? But we are about to bring great disaster on ourselves. Right? So there were some there who were reading Micah. right? And they're saying he said the same thing. And the king didn't kill him. If we kill him, possibly going to be worse for us. Again, very interesting. And again, I, I find it so fascinating, especially when you have one book referring to another book, right? Uh, and and again, think about today. Jeremiah is the big, big heavy book, right? Major prophets. Micah is just one of the minor prophets. And yet, in history, Micah was the major one, right? The important one. That, you know. Okay, Jehoiakim attempts to arrest uh, Jeremiah for a letter. Uh, you know. <laughs> Jeremiah doesn't quit. Nobody wants to listen to him. He gets chased around, so he sends a letter, a prophetic letter, and uh, this king, to show how much he values uh, the letter as it's being read, uh, he takes a knife and he starts cutting the letter as it's read in pieces and starts throwing it into the fire, throwing it into the fire, throwing it into the fire. So he's doing his own little symbolic act, right? This is what I think of the message, right? And your God. And of course, what does Jeremiah do? Write another one. <laughs> write another one and send it to him the prophet Hananiah opposes Jeremiah and dies we read this uh, section last time and uh, by the way these dates here the reason why these dates are here you know, if, if we were going really deep we'd, we'd put dates to all of this stuff but basically this is, these are the dates you know, before uh, 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 Jerusalem is destroyed but when the signs are there that it's happening and so Jeremiah is prophesying well before the first deportation in 597, right? So you've got some years there. And then here, there was already one deportation, but the second one hadn't happened yet. So this is a long ministry 
that even after they had suffered, they're continuing to resist. And, and he's in this, this you know, back and forth. Jeremiah gets imprisoned as well, right? And again, this is right before uh, the, 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 first, the second uh, exile, right? So the first one is in 597. The second one is in 586 BCE. In the first one, they take officials, they take all the important people and so forth, but they leave the temple intact. The second time they have to show up, they destroy it, burn it down, take everybody, kill, leave really just the poorest of the poor. No infrastructure, everything's destroyed. So this is just before that they imprison him. And you know, you can think about Jeremiah as a political prisoner, right? That would be the modern category, right? I mean, again, when we think of prophets, we don't usually think politics, but he was a political prisoner. His message was not being tolerated, right? Uh, it's kind of like in Russia, you speak out against Putin, people start falling out of windows, right? All of, everybody just falls out of window by mistake. Right? What is that about? Right? You get, or you get that poison that they give you when you die in days. Um, so, you know, Jeremiah, political prisoner, they're trying to shut him up. And then Jeremiah in a cistern, it's a well, he gets thrown into a well. By the way, he got thrown into the well, left to die. It's not like they're just going to leave him there if he can learn. Unless he was left to die. But someone saw him there and they pulled him out. Right? So, yeah, this is someone who truly suffered for his ministry, right? Uh, for his message, really. And uh, the king was against him. The priesthood was against him. The prophets were against him. His own people were against him. And as far as he's concerned, God was against him because he puts him in this impossible situation, right? Again, you can draw parallels with the New Testament. I mean, what did God say to Paul? After Paul had been persecuted the church. He calls him, right? He says, I will show him what? How much he has to suffer, right? Like that's, that is part of the plan. Nobody likes that. Who wants that? Yet it is tapered through all of the scriptures, this idea of suffering, right? And as a matter of fact, Paul even calls it as, as one who has suffered endlessly, a gift, right? That it is just as much a gift as salvation is a gift, right? Imagine if we really believed that, right? Nobody really believes that. Nobody really buys into that. I mean, you might for a moment, but you're immediately praying, relieve me of this, right? And yet, Paul, the way he puts it, it's to be expected. I mean, why are you following a savior who's carrying an instrument of execution? Where do you think he's headed? What do you think that's for, right? And, uh, you know, so again, you have that template already with someone like Jeremiah. Uh, being a prophet uh, wasn't easy. It's not like being a televangelist nowadays. You just say, plant your seed, give me money. That's the kind of prophecy I want. Okay, uh, non yoistic religious practices among God's cho uh, chosen. So here we'll have kind of a list of the sins that got them into trouble, right? And we'll see similar listings in Isaiah. We saw those. We'll see similar listings in, in the uh, uh, other prophets we're going to cover, Hosea, Amos, and so forth. The worship of Baal and Asherah. Baal, a male god, Asherah, was believed to be his consort, right? And uh, you know, she's usually dem uh, represented by a tree, uh, he by a stone, and they were treating God as if he were like Baal, and he had a consort. Uh, sacred poles, these are uh, wooden pieces that are found throughout uh, Palestine that showed how prevalent uh, the worship of Asherah was, right? She represents kind of the tree of life, uh, the wife of Baal. And no, mentioned in Kings, mentioned in Second Kings, and Micah as well. And by the way, I, I think I alluded to this, and, and I'll make more reference to it a little later. Uh, you have to remember that the book of Kings, you know, when it came to its final form, a lot of that probably was assembled or was tradition carried in Babylon. So while they are in exile is when they're reflecting on their history and what got us here, right? And so you see that kind of drumbeat with Kings. Uh, Jeremiah, well, there are some scholars who believe that Jeremiah might have been the author of Samuel Kings. Right, because a lot of the themes in those two books are, are echoed uh, throughout Jeremiah's prophecies, right? A lot of references to Deuteronomy and its theology. It's an interesting suggestion because, of course, the book is anonymous. Sexual activity in the high places, we talked about this. Fertility rights, right, where people are engaged in activity that, are, that is meant to, to stimulate the gods to rain down and bring crops, right? Uh, we saw this in Isaiah. Here we have it again in Jeremiah. 
cakes for the queen of heaven. Cakes for the queen of heaven. Women baking for the queen of heaven, right? They like to bake. <laughs> cakes for the queen of heaven, the Assyro-Babylonian goddess Ishtar. This is where, I, I, uh, I think this is the place where uh, Jeremiah confronts them about this worship. And they talk back to him, right? And not only talk back to him, but say, you think we're, we're doing this by ourselves? Our husbands are with us. And this is while they're out there in exile, right? This might be worth reading. Jeremiah 44, verses 15 to 30. 44, 15 to 30. Begin a little before. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I am determined to bring disaster upon you, to bring all Judah to an end. Again, this, is, this language is so strong. I am determined to bring disaster upon you, to bring Judah to an end. I mean, these are the things Jeremiah is saying. Who wants to hear that? I will take the remnant of Judah who are determined to come to the land of Egypt to settle, and they shall perish. Remember we talked about some of them fleeing to Egypt after they had been taken to exile, how they took uh, Jeremiah along with them. In the land of Egypt they shall fall by the sword and by famine. They shall perish from the least to the greatest. They shall die by the sword and by famine, and they shall become an object of execration and horror, of cursing and ridicule. I will punish those who live in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem with the sword, with the famine, with pestilence. So that none of the remnant of Judah who have come to settle in the land of Egypt shall escape to survive or return to the land of Judah. Although they long to go back to live there, they shall not go back except some fugitives. So again, remember, you've got two major powers, Babylon and Egypt. Babylon had taken the people of Judah into exile. Some of them are escaping to Egypt for aid, right? And so, you know, sometimes they're with Egypt, sometimes they're with Babylon. Then all the men who were aware that their wives had been making offerings to other gods, and all the women who stood by, a great assembly, all the people who lived in Pathros in the land of Egypt, answered Jeremiah, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord. Again, this is after hearing that message. We are not going to listen to you. Instead, we will do everything that we have vowed, making offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out libations to her just as we and our ancestors, our kings, and our officials used to do in the towns of Judah and in the street of Jerusalem. We've been doing this all along. We were doing this back in Palestine. We're not about to stop now. We used to have, now this sounds like the Israelites when they were in the desert longing for Egypt, right? We used to have plenty of food and prospered and saw no misfortune. Kind of amnesia, right? <laughs> saw them, they're in Egypt for heaven's sake. They saw, saw something. But from the time we stopped making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out libations to her, we have lacked everything and have perished by the sword and by famine. In other words, you're promising us sword and famine. It's when we stopped doing this that we got sword and famine. And the women said, Indeed, we will go on making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out libations to her. Do you think that we made cakes for her, marked with her image, and poured out libations to her without our husbands being involved? <laughs> so it's a household thing. Men and women, they're all doing it. The men are okay with it. So if you, if you, if you want to think about a patriarchal uh, society, right? Everybody, including the women, and tell Jeremiah where to go, right? Like, you, you get lost. We are not listening to you. I mean, that is a tough place to be. So they're making cakes for the queen of heaven. There are other prophets that refer to this uh, as well. And it's, it's interesting. You think about cakes. You think hostess, nice little cakes. Just something to eat. It's cute, right? No, this is this will get you in trouble. Yeah, please. I'm thinking traditions. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, the worship of, of Baal and the word tradition synonymous. I think that uh, from their point of view, that's exactly what it would have been. These are traditions that we have. We've had these traditions for as long as we can remember. And as a matter of fact, there are really fascinating echoes between the Canaanite 
uh, pantheon and the way their gods operate and some of the traditions of Israel, right? I mean, there's, so, and there are a bunch of theories about that, but yeah, you know, it's not like they're, they're saying, we want to be bad. We've been doing this all along, and this is how life worked for us. And now you're telling us something else. And remember, this guy has low credibility, right? And so certainly, now tradition sounds like a good term, right? That's tradition, mm -hmm. right? Um, I guess it depends on whether you are a trainant in that tradition or not. Uh, you know, some of these messages might have sounded new, even if they were going to be considered completely orthodox later, right? So yeah, I think tradition would have been a way of looking at it. Think it about today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I think that's one of the helpful things, I think, of having the canonical New Testament uh, at our disposal, right? You can look back and see uh, how close or how far you have come from the values that are inscribed there, right? And we all grow and develop and move in different directions, right? And there are things that it's part of the modern world, but there are other things that need to be uh, rethought, right? Um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I could probably go on and on, but there are things that we do as a matter of course of our lives that would have been probably unthinkable and probably problematic back then, right? There are ways in which science has made life uh, so much better and more bearable that some of the needs that are articulated in the Bible aren't needs anymore. Some things are seen differently. So, so there's this constant kind of wrestle back and forth between what the text says, how we view that coming along, and we adopt some traditions all along, and where we are now, we have to always reassess, reassess, reassess. Um, I don't know if I can give you an example, but you know, that's, that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, we talked a little bit about how we view money, right? Uh, you had a whole different, you know what did Paul say, <laughs> say uh, having food and raiment, therefore let us be content, right? I mean, Jesus saying, you know, if you have two coats, give one away. Right? I got a closet full, right? I mean, if you start taking, if you start really taking stock, if you decide, okay, uh, I'm at the point in my life where I am going to try and be as uh, close to the model of Jesus as I can, uh, it's hard living. It is hard living in terms of who you have to love, what you have to give up. Right? Um, uh, I, I think we all would stand indicted uh, to one degree or another. I mean, when he, when he tells people, give it all away, I mean, we, we immediately want to soften that. We can't possibly mean that, right? But his disciples understood precisely that. Because they said, well, who then can be saved? Right? It wasn't like they said, oh, we know you're being allegorical, Lord. I mean, you're really funny how you. <laughs> You stretch it like that to get us going, but, you know, we all got to eat. No, he says it. And they're like, well, wait a minute. Nobody can be saved then. And his response is, well, with God, all things are possible. Right? And then that's when you get the, the story of Zacchaeus right after that. Right? Someone who gives his stuff away. Now, what's interesting about Zacchaeus is he gives half. Right? And everybody, there's the loophole right there. Aha, Lord, thank God. Right? You see, even somebody who gave half can get in there, you know, uh, maybe I won't get the best mansion in the sky, but I can deal with a little one, right? And, uh, but the reason he gave half is because he owed the other half in, in, in restoration, right? He says, if I've defrauded anybody, I'll give them four times as much. He had nothing left, right? And so the lesson there is Jesus knows he's asking you the impossible. He knows it. But all things are possible with God. Now that's a hard, hard truth. Because when you think what's possible with God, you immediately think, I'm sick, I need a healing. God can heal me. Uh, my car is dead, I need a car. God can provide it. Right? Uh, you know, my children are trying to have children, and you know, they have God can provide children. And we think of all the things He can provide, and the one place where He says, All things are possible is specifically rooted in the statement, give it all away. We should be praying, God, you are the God of the impossible. 
make it possible for me to give everything away. I have never heard that sermon. <laughs> yet, yet, you know, if you think about uh, uh, what he's saying and the context in which he's saying it, um, that's basically the idea. Is that the Lord calling me? <laughs> to give it to the Hernandez. <laughs> Have them empty out their pockets by the end of it. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, you know, and I bring this up to the class. And of course, they're just exasperated, you know, by my students. And I'm glad you should be exasperated, right? Too comfortable being here, missing class because you got a vacation and whatnot. Just meet me, man. Okay, so, so you got these kids who are privileged, they're there. And I tell them this, and you know, of course, they're idealized, they want to serve God and so forth. And they're like, well, what do we do? What do we do? And you know, you, you got to eat, you got to wear stuff. I'm like, like, it's just inconceivable. And I said, well, there's no limit to your creativity. What if, as a group, let's say, we, let's say, you know, I tell this in the class, let's say, we're all in this class. And we're all convicted by this notion that we should give it all away. But we can't possibly think of a way to do that. And, you know, I can think of living more simply, blah, 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 but, but this zero-sum game, that's a little too much. I said, well, let's say that we all decided we would give enough money amongst ourselves to be the amount that would be the salary of one person, right? So that it's as if we collectively gave it all away as one person and see what happens, right? Well, the funny thing about that is that kind of creativity and leaning into that creates other opportunities, other ways of thinking about things, other ways of giving. And perhaps you may not be able to be like John the Baptist wearing sackcloth and ashes out there, right? Um, but you will definitely have been giving more than you ever gave and you will feel guilty about what you do have. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in other words, we, you know, it's the same thing, you know, like when, you know, be ye perfect as God is perfect. We all say, oh, well, we know we're not perfect, right? But you gotta strive for it. Well, it's the same thing with giving, right? There's no, there's no stopping point. The real stopping point is everything. That's Christianity. Well, how do you know it's everything? Well, our Savior gave everything on the cross, right? I mean. What else can you give but your life, right? And so that challenges our traditions, right? We have a tradition as Americans to live a certain way, right? Uh, and that's different depending on, you know, where you are. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so the scriptures have a, a wonderful way if you go back to them and try to read them in, in ways that, that are unfettered from our traditions to kind of convict us and bring us back to square one and think through how can I be a better Christian? How can I be a closer person who walks with God more closely? Um, and, and you should all feel like you have a, a, a ways to go. We all, because we do, we do. I'll tell you one thing, I have one student, one student I was teaching this message to, I was teaching to the whole class, you know, I just, just love to torture them with these truths, right? <laughs> you know, they all tell me, they all tell me they have a high view of scripture, right? And I'm like, you do? <laughs> and I tell this, and all of a sudden that scripture view is very low. It's very low and very allegorical, right? There's nothing literal about it. So uh, I had this one student, he's actually from Alaska, who uh, was sitting in his class, and uh, he decides to become a, a Bible miner after my class. Like, he's really into it and all that. Uh, but then he tells me afterwards that he has been haunted uh, by Luke's words giving it all ever since that class and he's come to my office several times and we're talking about over a couple of years it's not like you know it was just he had a little fever and then he's gone <laughs> right he came back and he's like, how can I do this and he asked me is it okay to have a job and have good things in my house and this kind of thing, but also give and and so he's been wrestling with how can he move in that direction because being that is impossible he knows that for himself right at least for now but how can I move in that direction so he's actually thinking about how to do nonprofit work and he's thinking about um, you know uh, working at a, in, in a way that it's not about profit right but it's about helping it so it's really interesting because this guy was not a Bible major He's a football player. I don't know, maybe he's a business major on the wrong side of the theological spectrum, right? I don't know. Um, but he's now 
well, you know, a Bible miner, and he's looking for ways. And I, you know, he's got his his, his girlfriend or fiance is at Dinah. And I said, oh, you might have to sacrifice that. People in Dinah got money. <laughs> <laughs> he chuckled, but I don't think he did that. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, tradition, yes, uh, you know, who knows how, what truckloads of sin, you know, get, get, get ferried under tradition. Um, child sacrifice is mentioned here, just like we mentioned it in Isaiah, uh, Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. Remember one of the symbols of Jeremiah was taking that earthen vessel and, and breaking it at the Valley of Hinnom. This is what would later become the place that is, is, is the... Uh, generating idea for hell, right? Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. Um, so apparently child sacrifice was, was reported to have happened there. And these are the reasons, by the way, why God was destroying Judah, you know, according to Jeremiah, and this was one of them. So you have his symbolic act, and you have the report here. Worship of astral deities, right? The sun, the moon, the stars. Remember when uh, the, the temple was cleansed, right? What did they find in it? All kinds of objects related to sun, moon, and stars, right? Babylonian deities and whatnot. Uh, and of course, you know, in Deuteronomy, it talks about, you know, this is one of the things that will get you destroyed, right? That's the other thing to bear in mind about First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings is that uh, the, the standard for what happens to a king comes out of the book of Deuteronomy. That's why they call them the Deuteronomistic history. Right, so the book of Deuteronomy lays out the pros and the cons, what you can and can't do. Here are the rewards and here are the punishments. And then Joshua, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, all follow that, that, that theology. So you know a king is successful if he follows Deuteronomy. You know he's a failure before God if he doesn't. And the punishments uh, come down. So, uh, and uh, Jeremiah's theology is believed to be very Deuteronomistic. Right? And that's why they think there's a close link, at least in traditions, between Jeremiah uh, and 1st uh, Second Samuel, 1st Second Kings. Um, sun, the moon, and the stars, uh, it's believed that, that this is why the creation account in Genesis reads the way it does. Um, one of the things you'll notice in Genesis, we might have talked about this at some point. When God creates the sun, uh, what does Genesis 1 say? He created what? It wasn't the sun. Light. Well, he says, let there be light, but then he creates the sun, but he calls it day. Close. The greater light, right? The sun is the greater light, and the moon is the lesser light, right? That's, you know. And again, you, you look at that, oh, that's poetic, right? That's that, you know, God loves a poem, right? There you go. Okay. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the word for sun, shamesh in Hebrew, is also what you call a sun god, the sun god. And in antiquity, if you have someone say, God created Shemesh to a non-Israelite, you know, Israelite, it looks like God created the sun god. And pagan gods are creating other gods all the time. So rather than say, sun, it says greater light. The moon, Urea, the Hebrew word Urea, is the name of the moon god. If you have God creating Yarea, it's God creating the moon god. So rather than saying that, you have him creating the lesser light, right? And then the stars, you know, they are, they're kind of demoted as the last thing. Stars were extremely important in Babylonian religion, right? You tell the future all sorts of things. I mean, they were, they were stargazers, right? So it's demoted as one of the last things. So there is a theological a coloring and framing of the creation account just in the way it frame, talks about things. And then you see sun, moon, stars. These things are big deals in Israelite religion because when they, when they clean out the temple, they find all that in there. Right? Remember when they found the book, which is believed to be the book of Deuteronomy, by the way? Right? They find all of this stuff. They read that book like oh, we're dead. Right? And they <laughs> empty it out of all of this stuff. So they're really, really interesting. These are the sins. Um, a few examples of poetic features. Poetic features. Do we? Oh, by the way, do we have to leave early because of uh, Roger's ninetieth uh, birthday? Is there, there's a group that's going to meet here at eleven forty-five. Okay. So what? 
Okay. okay. Five minutes? Sure. Okay. Seven? All right, Dave, you got you get mad at Dave. Don't get mad at me. It's all about grace. It's all about grace. All right. <laughs> Not tradition. Not tradition. Okay. <laughs> Poetic features often talk about the prophets as, as poets and, and activists and, and so forth. Uh, if you were studying Hebrew uh, and you were learning how to read it, um, the poetry sections of the Old Testament will be the hardest sections to read, right? Uh, because poetic language tends to be ambiguous and creative and does all sorts of things with metaphors and similes, so it's harder to read. Well, Jeremiah's words often have a poetic uh, flavoring to them. So here's some examples. You've got parallelisms, right? Parallelisms is just like when you have one line and then the second line repeats the same idea, or it can be a, an opposite idea, or it can complement it. Right? This is something that happens repeatedly in Hebrew poetry. You have examples of that in Jeremiah. Similes and metaphors, many of them sexual. I mean, this is the thing. Jeremiah, I may mean, have one professor who, who blamed Jeremiah's uh, potty language here to the fact that he was celibate, right? And that he, because he's celibate, he had special longings, and it comes through in his scripture. Uh, but he, he refers to... Uh, the people of Israel, and before it says, is insatiable whores. Again, it's, it's not the kind of language you want to teach in a Sunday school. You guys have been around the block, I think. <laughs> uh, wild animals in heat, right? I mean, that's, it, you know, who wants to think about that, right? But that's how he, you know, pegs them for their behaviors and, and, and their practices. Uh, the prostitute offering herself to her captors. This is particularly ugly. Right, and and here, what he's basically saying is that, that that's what you're going to be like, right? The judgment that is going to be upon you, you're going to be so desperate, you're going to be like the woman who gets captured, and to save her life, she throws herself at her captors, right? And it's again really a disturbing uh, kind of language. Um, you think about how we deal with language, right? Uh, there are things that we think is not good language, right? You don't speak that way. You don't speak that way as a Christian. You don't speak that way, you know. And yet, at least in the biblical narrative, none of that was hands off, right? What mattered was the greater truth of what's being said, right? And sometimes deep truths that need to be said to get your attention are said in very ugly ways, right? Uh, it could be humor, it could be lampooning. It could also be really disgusting to get your attention. Uh, and, you know, Paul, of course, I mean, Paul uses this kind of language as well, right? You think about Paul when he's fed up with the, with the Galatians and, and the people who are coming in and troubling them with, you know, pressing them for circumcision. He basically says, I wish that those who are pressing you to do this would castrate themselves. I mean, it does just roll off the tongue, right? <laughs> I hope not, not for a minister. Uh, but, yeah, so, so it, this is the other thing. It makes you think about language, Right? You want to, some of us want to rule out something as we're not listening to that because the language is bad. If you had to rule stuff out because the language is bad, you'd have to censor the Bible, right? And even worse, sometimes the word plays in the Bible are actually ribald. We don't catch them because we don't read Hebrew. But they do word plays there that will turn you red in the face, right? Don't read that. I mean, they're like a, a comic who's, who's uh, R-rated sometimes. There it is. So it makes you think. And then, of course, the metaphor of rape. And the language that is used is out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 22, 25, 27 basically talks about a woman. If she's out there in the field and someone comes and, and seduces her and she cries out and no one hears her and he forces himself on her, right? That's the, So this is the law pertaining to that. Well, the language that that uh, uh, Jeremiah uses about God is the same language. Again, note the connection with Deuteronomy. He says, you know, I was out there. You seduced me. I cried out. Nobody heard me. Right? So this is someone who's definitely paying the cost for his ministry. And, you know, again, these are just kind of um, use of language that still falls under the poetic uh, category. We're almost done here. There's irony, of course. Sarcasm. I don't know if you like sarcasm, but it's in the Bible. <laughs> Word plays as well. You know, if we had time, we'd, we'd read all of these. Uh, and cryptograms. Cryptograms. Basically, 
you know, things that are spelled differently and, and they, they symbolize something else. You think about 666, Mark of the Beast, right? It's kind of a cryptogram. You have similar things to that. So um, you've got the reference to Shesha, which is Babel, the Babylonians, Leb Kamai, Hasidim, the Chaldeans. And, and again, this is, this is playful. This is a way of getting attention. Uh, think about, again, I don't know if you, if you like reading or immersing, uh, immersing yourself in literature, but writers will play with language. Right? They're not just telling a story, they're not just rearranging, but they play with language. And the language is meant to draw you in, shock you, make you laugh. You can kind of see where they're going just by the language. Prophets do the same thing. All right, let's celebrate Moberg. Thanks for that. <laughs>